Greetings, it is I, Tantas Nara Magico, your Lord and Emperor here, Magico and Empire, and morning to all of you, or afternoon, or wherever you are, wherever you are. Yes, today, if I had my a red shirt and had uh, actually bought one, um, like my good friend Cho would have, I'd be wearing it. Yes, we're going to the wonderful world of Star Trek today. So we're going from fantasy to sci-fi, but a different kind of sci-fi because it is a uh, a very different system, uh, just because of the emotionality and the way that things are work in the world here, uh, which will be hard to explain. I'm not going to go into details on what it means to play in a Star Trek game. I'm going to go over the basic concepts behind it. So we're going to do we are going to do some here's how the world works a little bit. But we're really going to dive into character creation of Star Trek today. And of course, I have my uh, physical copy of the book here. Ba boom And I also have the PDF uh, gotten through. Again, I've gotten a lot of these humble bundles and stuff uh, through Modifius. Uh, thanks, Modifius, uh, for uh, you know, occasionally having things too. Not as much as Paizo. Uh, uh, Post-scarcity -scar sci-fi. This is um, idealized society sci-fi. Um, where, uh, you think of it this way. The easiest way to describe a Star Trek world, if you've not seen any Star Trek, is it's supposed to be post-scarcity, where all of your basic needs, both physically and physically, are provided for. So if you need a house, you get a house. If you need, like, things to, like, you know, you tools in that house, you get those tools. So it's very utopian. And then, uh, if you want luxuries, you can work. And you get a stipend for your luxury for your work uh, that are for luxury things. So if like you know you get a replicator which just creates food, a replicator food is kind of meh. It's okay, but it's not really super flavorful. It's the basics. You want to go out and get something that you know is grown by some people. Go get a job. You know you don't need to get a job. You could. You're encouraged to because you better yourself. It's all about bettering stuff. It's near utopia, I would call it. There's still problems. We're still humans. It's it, there's a lot to just to break down on Star Trek, but you have to think of it that way. And for playing in a basic Star Trek game, you're joining Starfleet. So actually, you know, uh, rather than just giving this introduction, let's get right into it. So let me throw myself up over into the talk corner, and let me throw. I believe this is the one out. Boom! The PDF, which for whatever reason is dual paged. <sighs> Uh, I, I, I've, I've kind of fixed the formatting. Uh, it does this weirdly. A bunch of these Star Trek ones do this kind of weirdly. Anyway, um, at least this one is. Uh, I might have a mistake in it or something. Uh, I, I'm not good with PDFs to sw switch how things are. But this is the way it's, it's displayed. Anyway, so let's talk about Star Trek just as a general thing. They talk about the eras of play here. That's not something you're going to have to matter about. What you're going to have to think about here is Starfleet. Starfleet, as it is, if you're playing in this game, when you're making your character, think of it this way. It is a combination of peacekeeping, military, exploration, science, and all those kind of things group. Um... I, it's it's fine. As long as like I've got the pages open, it's fine. I, I I'll mess with it later to fix it. You know. Uh. So, I'll worry about it later. Um, this should be fine. I already set up for it. But thank you. So think about it this way. Um, if you join Starfleet, you can go into different fields. Um, and a Starfleet vessel can be. Uh, put to certain jobs. A general ves vessel will do things like patrolling uh, Starfleet territory, exploring the edge of Starfleet territory, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, conflicts, uh, dealing with external threats, uh, you know, uh, dealing with uh, things that are like, you know, maybe just delivering stuff, uh, moving materials around. Uh, taking care of first contacts with other uh, for diplomat diplomatic uh, things. There's a lot of different things you do as a Starfleet, but it is very it got this military overtone. 
because they have they have they have a strict hierarchy and a strict order, and the, the reason is it's like you have to be a multi-purposed you, but you have to also be ready to you know fight and defend the places because you are also the peacekeepers of the Federation, of uh, the Federation of Planets, which is the setting for it, and you are also the you know if an external threat deals with the Federation, you also have to rise up to fight against that. And your vessels are armed with weapons. You would prefer not to use them. Talk first. Battle later. But, you know, it happens. Yeah, it should format, because it does have the correct number of pages of 376. So I'll worry about it later, though. I'll keep thinking about it. Uh, you've got me thinking about it now. Um, but, so that's kind of like where you're going to come out with for this world, to think about it. Um, that's This is good stuff to think about for your beginning character. And the various uh, eras, which they talk about here, are basically time periods in the development of the United Federation of Planets and uh, the Star Trek universe. Um, a lot of these, like, by next generation is your most idealized form of, you know, what would be the original series and Enterprise, which is kind of a prequel. And there are other areas that have been added, areas that have been added in from various other uh, Star Trek media, which you can use to, to your degree. But regardless, we'll focus kind of on the generalistic, which is between original series and next gen and that kind of world. All right. So, an important other thing you're gonna have to think about is that you as a character, as a player character, are probably going to have a main character. There will be supporting characters in your crew, because you're gonna have a crew, and you're not gonna have enough players to fill the entire crew. And there will be other important roles that have to be taken up by like these supporting characters. So these are a little bit more than an NPC. Like we, they are technically NPCs, non-player characters. But the fact is that supporting characters might be that if you take on important roles, it could be something like you don't have a chief engineer. Your chief engineer would be supporting character because it would be another like named character, but it's not like the ones that, you know, your, if we're talking next generation, your Picards, your Rikers, your Datas are your player characters because they show up in like every episode. And then you're like your, your, your Beverly Crusher or your Deanna Troy or your Geordies might be supporting characters without showing up in every one. Think of it that way, you know, you've got your main billing at top actors and then the actors below that, and it's up to you to develop who those are in the group and work with your um, game master to develop that. So, there are some important terms we have to talk about. Traits, values, those are the first two we're going to talk about, which are going to be the more complex ones to talk about for reasons, and then attributes, disciplines, and focuses, uh, and talents which are the things that build your actual character. Traits and values build your character, but don't build your character. That is confusing to say, but it is a base explanation. So, we got an idea of what you're making for your characters. And the thing is, keep in mind, the system here is built in such a way that you can support your supporting characters, because the supporting characters will make a difference to anything you're doing. You are working as a team on a ship, so maybe you've got all your main characters and your supporting characters, but if one of your main characters, if one of your supporting characters is in an important role, maybe your chief of security, maybe your engineer, maybe your doctor, maybe the comms officer who's piloting the ship, uh, maybe this uh, scientist who knows a lot of stuff, you can do things to improve them just as you improve yourself. Um, so keep that in mind. Let's talk traits. Um, your species will always be a trait. That's an important thing about your traits. Traits are like uh, short, wor single words or short phrases that e e exemplify your existence. And these are what you are, just not physically and mentally, but they what you are. They define you as um, not, again, think about it this way. Um, as your character's species, you know, if I'm human, if I'm Beta Z, if I'm Vulcan, if I'm Klingon, if I'm Frangie, if I'm whatever, Romulan, uh, any 
species that is out there in the Star Trek universe, which you can play some and some you can't play, and there's rules for playing a lot of different ones. We'll talk about that. Um, traits end up being things that are just a definition of you. Um, they aren't your personality motivations and beliefs. Those are your values. These are just these words which define you otherwise. So it's not like this is something I believe, this is something part of my personality, this is some kind of, you know, uh, motivation I have. That's what when you get to know values, which we'll talk about in a second here. Uh, there is a definition of what you can and cannot do built into this. Um, so you get traits for different things. The example they give here is if you're if anybody is familiar with Next Generation with Jordy LaForge, he is blind. Um, he has a device to help him see, but because of that, he gets the traits human and blind. These define him very well. Um, so traits are very, very neutral things. They're applied positively, negative, and you never know how many you're going to have. It depends on your character creation. Um, and as you build your character will determine your traits. Values, on the other hand, as I said, are exactly what they sound like. At different points in your character creation, you will have be tasked with coming up with values. Values that are affected by that part of the character creation. If I'm supposed to be in Starfleet for the first time, if I'm going to the Academy and I have to choose a value, think of a value I have learned there. If it's when I'm back on my home, uh, home on my home colony, home planet, home world, wherever it's at, and I'm existing there uh, as I'm growing up, what values did I learn there? Um... And you, that's a good way of thinking about when you gain these ones. Again, I like the examples they give in the book. They use James T. Kirk. The examples they give that Kirk has, as from the original series of Star Trek, uh, doesn't believe in no-win situations. There's no such thing as the unknown, only the temporary hidden. Married to the Enterprise, and risk is our business. Um, those are the four traits they, to, uh, or values that they say James T. Kirk has. And if you think about that, that gives a variety of the way a person thinks. So that's why these are very nebulous things that are important parts of your character. Your traits, of course, define you in a way. They're neutral things that define your existence. And your values define how your character kind of acts to a degree. And I will tell you, your values are important. They aren't static, though. Um... You know, it's the idea that um, they're a driving force for your character, these values, and they can evolve and change with experiences uh, because of things that may happen during the adventures. Um, and, you know, you get opportunities to cha change your values, but they start with how your character thinks, and something could occur in-game which evolves the way that you think your character thinks that you can change a value, because there are advantages and disadvantages to using your values. You can use your values. They are something that affects your character physically in the actual mechanical part of rolling stuff in the game. More than just, hey, they're a thing that helps you define your personality. D&D has a bunch of personality traits that you fill out that gives you an idea how your character works. They give examples under each of the backgrounds. This is one where you don't really have examples. You have an idea of where you're coming from and where you might have learned stuff and a combination of backgrounds and information and just kind of put it together. And, you know, it is the one part of this system that I, I like it a lot, but is also very nebulous. And I think that nebulousness can have an issue for you developing it. Just, if you're having trouble struggling with figuring it out, talk with your GM. They can help you work with it and figure out some good values that make sense. Because again, like, uh, if you have a conviction, a belief, an attitude, a goal, like, uh, or a, um, I guess, what was the word that they used here? Um, a motivation. This is a good place to kind of come up with them for your, for your character. We will talk about the attributes. Attributes. Because there are six attributes similar to many other RPG systems. Um, d and six attributes. Uh, Pathfinder, the same. But they are very different attributes. And defining them for you is great. Um, 
they range from 7 to 12, um, 8 representing average capabilities. So 7 is slightly below average. That's what you have to think about. And you're never going to have below a 7 in any attribute. Um, you have to think about it as, like, those that are joining Starfleet tend to be the best, the brightest, the most motivated. Remember, if you are within the United Federation of Planets and a member of that, your basic needs are provided for. Why would you join Starfleet? Well, again, it's that idea of betterment of self. So you are probably not going to have many deficiencies. And if they are deficiencies, they're going to be very minor deficiencies, a.k.a. 7, when 8 is the average. So you never get that below. And 12 is the maximum. So there, there is only a, there's not a huge range here to think about. Um... And then, of course, non-humanoid creatures might have different ability attributes and how they're set apart because they're non-humanoid. That's different. Basic humanoids have a basic idea of this. Um, so, let us talk about these attrib attributes. Control. So, this is uh, your accuracy, your self-control, your precision. Um, it does have to be degree not only mental with your self-control, but it could also be like... You're doing some fine skilled things, you know, um, you know, perfect timing, uh, delicate work, uh, keeping your cool uh, under stressful situations. So you think it, this is not just a physical, it is also a mental thing, control, but it is your ability to control yourself in a situation where you might have to be doing something really exact or keeping calm. Daring, on the other hand, is uh, your sudden reaction to a situation. That's the easiest way to do it. Uh, how to act uh, without hesitation, without caution, uh, to be brave. It's your response in an emergency, as they say here. Um, but acting on instinct. Uh, also to resist mental attacks. Uh, also, and fear and stuff like that happens under there. So again, it's both like a physical and a mental thing. As a lot of these actually can be kind of this way. This one is like when you're daring your ability just to like you know uh react under a cool uh, under a stressful situation correctly or to like uh know when aggression is appropriate um and uh, avoid dangers and stuff like that you know it's your saving throw to a trap or your um you know improvised speech uh trying to convince something that you have maybe uh, a, a few seconds to convince not to kill you, to, to like, you know, shoot you with something. Um, that's daring. Fitness, of course, is your physical conditioning, general health, well-being, and endurance. This is the only one that I would call actual physical stuff, you know. <clears throat> it is your physical form in general. And, um... Ability to, and this, it's not only like, oh, I can lift something heavy, it's how long you go in endurance. So there's a combination of things when it comes to fitness. Insight. Uh, that's, it's exactly what it kind of sounds like. It's like insight that shows up in, I guess, uh, 5e. Um, it's, you know, understanding the feelings of another creature, um, thinking of how do they act, um, you know, uh, it's, your own emotional intelligence, empathy, and experience combined into understanding what's going on in the world around you. Um, you could also use it to calm and reassure others, overcome your own judgments and preconceptions. So the insight is not only on the outside world, it can be on yourself too, which is a very interesting use of insight. It's sort of like, if you've been going down the wrong path, you, if you have a high enough insight, you could realize that your decisions are going down the wrong path and switch it when it is kind of adamantly against the kind of direction you would normally take. So again, this is another one that has this more connotations than just the general idea of it. It has more opening. Presence is your ability to command, attention, and respect, your power of your personality. Presence is kind of like the charisma score if you're coming from a D&D. &D. It's what you're using during negotiations, uh, giving orders during a crisis. And it can, often, it can also be used if you're, you know, charming and seducing people. It could be your diplomacy, too. That kind of level of your presence there. 
um, you know, trying to like change people's uh, opinions directly or uh, manipulate others. That's when you use presence. Of course, reasons is logic and uh, analysis. This is when you're forming a hypothesis or an intricate plan, uh, recalling facts, calculating things uh, deeply. It is your kind of intelligence score is reason. Though again, it, it, it's when you want to analyze something through the you know very cold logic, reason, facts kind of things like that. Um, uh, doing complex calculations, uh, uh, you know, researching something that's very complex. You're doing reason. So as you can see, the six attributes of Star Trek are very different than these. Then we get into disciplines, which is the other part of this entire endeavor. You are going to be always rolling an attrib attribute and a discipline. Eh, not always, I should say, but 99% of the time. There are some exceptions, but we're not going to get into that today. That's in, like, the rules of the game. But I will tell you there are a few exceptions, but normally I'm rolling, like, a reason command or a insight engineering, or a fitness con. Fitness security is a lot better, but... See, I'm rolling a combination of these two things for my system, which I'm rolling. Which, uh, if you want to know about the basic system, which I should probably tell you, it is 2d20 system. So these nice little nice d20, you roll two of them. Um, 10 and 12 is what I rolled. That's the basic roll, uh, two dice. And what you want to roll is under your combination of reason or, or attribute plus discipline. So think about it this way. My attributes maximized at 12 and my discipline is maximized at five because your disciplines can be from zero to five. I have a 17. On 2d6, I get a success when I roll underneath a 17. And most checks can be one, one success. Some of them can be more successes. And the idea is you start with 2d6 dice you can roll more dice because there can be difficulties that require more successes than two. There you go. That's the basics of rolling system, which I just introduced here, which is a good idea to do. So, again, your character is not really going to have a zero in a discipline. If you went to Starfleet, in there are other games which you could theoretically do in the Star Trek universe where you might have a zero in a discipline possibility or a uh, NPC you're dealing with might have a zero in a discipline you could be meeting a person that learned nothing about engineering in their life if they're just a doctor that never went to Starfleet and was just on a planet you know that's what they learned think of Starfleet as gonna give you a basic training in all of the disciplines you know so as a main character you start with one uh, you've got extensive training and uh, basically because players are officers in Starfleet you're hot, you've got a rank, you know, you're not just a, a grunt, so to say, or a normal person, you're an officer, you have that extensive training that is, have you at least a basic proficiency in these things. You understand the basics of what's going on. Um, there are six departments in a Starfleet um, ship, starship, and each discipline they do kind of overlap in ways, you know, uh, the thing is like, think about medicine and science are pretty close to each other. Those are two different disciplines and they overlap in a lot of places, just like, um, you know, certain other things like command, con, engineering might overlap, uh, you know, command might overlap with security in certain ways, you know, but these are things that overlap in various intersections in the way that these disciplines work. And it's one of the reasons that you can kind of learn each of these very, you know, have these initial ranks. Because learning the basics of starship operations and the being an officer, because that's what, again, you went to the Starfleet Academy, you're an officer, you're not just an enlisted. There are just people that just enlist and don't have as much skill. Uh, you know, that are just the general grunts and that are probably, like, doing some stuff on that starship. There there are people that are, like, you know, the, the guy that does routine maintenance. That exists on a Starfleet ship. It's an NPC. It's, it, I mean, like, there could be a reason for it to be a supporting cast member if you're, you know, depending on the storyline. But normally it's just the dude. Um, so, command is what it sounds like. 
And the thing is, they do give examples for all six attributes for using these things. It's, um... It's leadership, it's negotiation, it's coordinating and motivating others. Um, it can also be resisting co coercion would be under command. Uh, and helping others resist fear and panic. You know, inspiring your group. That is command. It is your, basically, ability to lead the group. And you will have, as an officer, at least a little bit of it, aka rank one, the basic understandings of what it is. But depending on your position, you might have more command, and it might make more sense. Uh, but you might not also, like, lead through your words. You might lead through your actions, depending on the department you're in. Con, it's piloting the craft. This could be ground vehicles, shuttles, to big old starships. It's navigation, too, which is an important thing, because understanding the... <coughs> the way things work, and it could be ground and space. And it also would be like the procedures and cultures of various things but related to space travel and exploration. <clears throat> That's an important part of it too. You know the procedures. So if you run into another person, another ship that's not a Federation ship, you know general procedures what to do with Khan when dealing with those other starships. Um, engineering, it's engineering. It's the technology. It's maintaining, repairing, understanding the technology of your starship. You know, you know how a replicator works. I know how the warp crawl drive works that allows us to create a bubble of subspace and travel faster than light. That's what that's what a starship does in Star Trek. They create a bubble of, like, subspace around them and then use that bubble, along with the warp drive, to travel faster than light. They, they cheat the universe. Uh, there's probably a better explanation to it, but that's why Star Trek ships can travel past in light. They, they create a subspace field that's basically like kind of drawing themselves outside of space, allowing them to travel faster than light. It's complex, and there's probably things that explain it a lot better than I could explain. And even then, there are sci-fi explanations, which Star Trek is a good idea to sometimes explain these things. You, as an engineer... As a player, don't have to know your character would. You know how the replicator works. You know how the transporter works. You know how all the engines work. That's engineering. Uh, security. It's combat. Um, you know how to use a phaser and shoot things in case you have to do it. You know how to switch your settings from stun to kill if you really need to. Uh, but it also, like, if you need to intimidate or interrogate someone, if you have to be like stealthy and infiltrate something. Uh, you know about weapons and combat styles. You might know how some survival skills are actually under there, too. Um, and certain levels of athleticism. So having a little bit of security isn't a bad thing anyway. You know, you know a couple of things. You might know a martial arts style that if you need to get into an unarmed combat, you can. Security is the use of some kind of force normally. Um, it, 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 essentially, that's the, the ease of part of it. It's Knowing also when to use force um, and understanding that more. It's the time and place for, you know, bringing out force. Um, science. It's honestly exactly what it sounds like. It's the general science. Um, it tends to be the hard sciences. Uh, physics, chemistry, biology, some social sciences, anthropology. Um, there's a lot of different sciences that are out there. Um, honestly, if there's a certain one that you want to kind of specialize in more than another, you could. You could be, uh, you know, no archaeology. You could know, uh, uh, xenobiology. Or, you know, there's a lot of different lists for, for science that you can go into. And then, of course, medicine, which is, uh, this tends to be physical and mental makeup of all life forms. That's an important thing here, too. Because medicine is not only, like... The physical medicine of, like, I can cure your elements and diseases, treat your injuries. But also, it could be, you know, the uh, counselor kind of position. A counselor studying some medicine. They know some of the basics. They know kind of the way the mind works and work to heal the mind of a lot of things. Because as much as, you know, you semi-utopian society, again, the reason I have a counselor is, you know, on a starship, especially the large starship, they don't, smaller starships might not have a counselor. Um, on a larger one, they have that because, hey, things happen to people. 
you get traumatic events, stresses, and talking with someone and working with ways to uh, deal with a lot of these problems, great idea. Turns out they have a great mental health system in the future. Ah, so again, like, it comes down to uh, where you'd use this for various things, and it's your training that you do with things. And that's where your training comes in. Focus is. Focus is a narrow set of in your discipline. Um, so we talked about, you know, your six disciplines. You will have focuses in each of your... Uh, yeah, that's what it is. They fold space and move through space. They cheat relativity. Uh, in, in a way. You will have... Um, six focuses basically as your main character uh secondary characters have like less and stuff like that that kind of thing but your the character you're building your main character basically six things that are within the six disciplines they can be spread apart between each of the disciplines if you really want to have like a jack of all trades or honestly there is no link technically between disciplines and focuses um you could be under more than one with them too like astrophysics they give the example of astrophysics is very good for science but it could also be very good for con um and you uh you know it, it's the idea that it wants to narrow down the the six disciplines you're in um and uh, again you're gonna have ones and everything so honestly if you didn't get beyond a one in something during your character creation, it could make sense that you don't have a focus in that. You have the very basic training. But if you have at least a two in everything, I would recommend you then honestly put a focus in each of your different things. This is just the kind of ideas that you want to kind of spread out your focuses. Anything that I've got a two or higher in, I want to focus in. After that, you can have a focus in a one. Honestly, if you went and you had your one security and you really liked survival skills, you could, uh, you know, focus on survival. Um, and that could be your thing. And honestly, focuses do help your character. The big thing a focus does is, and again, with one, it doesn't really help a lot. It increases your um, crit range, I would say. Normally, Rolling a one, because remember, you're rolling under a number. Rolling a one is a critical. Uh, rolling one that has a focus, a, a, a check that you can use a focus on, allows you to roll the discipline you're rolling as your crit range. So if I have a discipline of five, I crit from one to five when I'm rolling my focus check. So when you're rolling something that you, have a that you might have a focus in, you ask your, hey, GM, can my focus apply to this check? And if they say yes, you're like, boom. I now have to roll, uh, if I roll a uh, a four, I get a crit success or lower. Cool, I'm better that way. So you're very different than D&D, you want to roll low. Uh, there's no critical failure for 20, you're just not getting a success. Because you either get a success or you don't. That's it. It's just if you get a critical success, it's better. Okay, cool. And then that focuses. Talents is the last thing your character is going to have. Let's talk about what a talent is. A talent is basically a special ability, something that gives you bonus dice, uh, re-rolls, bonus momentum. We're not talking about momentum today. That's a complexity that's part of the actual playing of the game. We'll have to handle another day. Uh, bonuses and abilities you can use with different disciplines, that kind of thing. That's a talent. Um, I talked about the other day, if you join me for that, skill feats. Uh, for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which added a new ability to an existing skill you had. That is what a talent is. There's a new ability to an existing thing you have. Whether that takes the form of, if I'm rolling a certain thing, I can roll an extra die, an extra d20. Remember I said, you, 2d20 is the basic system, you can roll more dice. I said that. There are ways to. Or maybe I can re-roll something. These are options you get that talents can give you. Let's report for duty in Starfleet. It's the life path creation. Let's go over the actual rules now that we know the basics of what's going to be on our character sheet for creating that character. There are seven steps as you see here and they are broken down very easily. 
very simply. Now, there are some things here that we will talk about. And uh, that will be important, because we're going to. And there's some numbers we're going to have to add up to in the end. That's another important thing. Basically, um, think of it this way. At the end, I should be able to add all my tributes together and all my um, disciplines together and get a certain number for the basic character creation. That's it. So, starting off, your character, seven each attribute, one in each discipline. Hey, look at that. I should not have a, more than a 12 in any attribute. And I may only have one attribute at 12 and one discipline at 5 at the end. These are things that are very important to your character creation. These are your basic limits. There are rules if you end up with more than these. Like if I ended up with two 12s or two 5s, there are rules to move things around. All right, let's talk about step one, your species. Am I human? Am I another kind? There are mixed heritages they talk about here. If you want to be like a half, uh, half human, half Vulcan, you can be one. Half human, half Klingon exist. Uh, those are two of the ones that I can point out. There are other mixed uh, heritage characters because science has allowed a lot of these, you know, species that are, you know, semi-compatible to be compatible with enough science. Uh, they scienced it, they can get together if you really want to. Uh, prob it probably involves a lot of, you know, specialized things to do that. Uh, but it does, it happens, and so these exist. Uh, you can look into it more if you're interested. I'm going to say right now we're not going to talk about misheritages. It's something that if you want to do, talk with your GM, look into it, figure it out, and uh, you can do it. It is an option. I'm not disallowing it. I'm just not going to talk about it too much right now. You know? Um, so, there's random species table. Don't worry about those right now. Choose your species. Simple as that. It's, you know, there are more species in Starfleet than there are in the book. I'm going to tell you what the ones in the book here. I'm not going to go over them. These are the ones in the basic book. There are ones from other books. Uh, there are other sources you can find that have other ones. There are a lot out there. So, there are a lot of unique ones out there that you can play. Starfleet is filled with a lot of member species out there. A lot of people have get joined it. There are a lot less in the original series. Very few that would be, you know, working with them in the, like, Enterprise era. Um, that might uh, join with that kind of ship and stuff and help them out. Next Gen is really when you got most of these. Anyway, <clears throat> first thing that you get for being a species is you get... Three attributes. These are the things that your species is good at. If I'm a Klingon, I get this, this, and this that I get bonuses to. If I'm a human, I get this, this, and this, etc., etc. So you, it's the three attributes you get plus one to those listed ones. Then you get a trait, which happens to be your species. You know, you are a member of that species. It's your physiology, uh, the shared history, the culture it represents. At very least. Now, you can certainly be in a situation where you have less of the cultural and shared history, but you're physically still going to be it. If you are Worf, uh, a, a Klingon that was mostly raised by humans from, ba from a relatively young age, um, you know, so has a little bit less of the Klingon culture, has a little bit of that when they were very young, they still are physically a Klingon. And with the way the world works now, he learned a lot of Klingon culture by basically looking it up and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, there are others that they have rules for that still, you know, because of various reasons, you could come up a reason with that aren't part of Starfleet could join them. You could be a, uh, a special Romulan dignitary. There would be a lot of distrust for the Romulan, but maybe that's part of your entire character. Why are you there? Are you there because of like some kind of like science exchange? You know, the Romulans in the in the uh, Federation have always been at odds. Doesn't mean you couldn't play one. It could be for an interesting point. And the thing is, you probably aren't going to have an overarching star uh, storyline of spy work. You're probably just actually going to be in a science exchange. Now, it doesn't mean you know 
the, the rulership of Romulus is like, if you find out anything spy-wise, you could tell us. But, you know, if you're a scientist, you could certainly have it that, like, maybe that's the dichotomy, is that you don't want to betray your people, but you also don't want to betray these people that you have agreed to take you on as, like, an exchange person as part of whatever kind of thing. Because the Federation does like doing stuff like that because it, hey, this person might learn a few things about our group of people and get it on and get through that. Or again, it could be some like similar to Worf. Worf was adopted by humans. That's why he joined Starfleet. Normal Klingons just don't do that because they're in Klingon society. Um, so again, uh, uh, various reasons by whatever you can play, you can play it. Um, so the traits I, I was talking about there. Um, some traits might have other abilities depending on what you are. Like if uh, you're if I'm uh, this uh, species and we're particularly resistant to toxins, hey, if I encounter toxins, I can say, hey, my trait says that uh, I'm this group and that we're resistant to this. Or this group and I have this. You know, that can come up. And then you get a talent. And we talked about talents that are special abilities. Hey, there are usually a few different talents to choose from um, uh, as a species. So it can be chosen from any available to the character. Also, it, the talent you choose from your species doesn't have to be a species talent. That's the important thing here. It could be one that you just learn. There's a main talent list later on in the book. You could go over there and choose one of those talents that you learned. Um, again, the small number of talents available to each species is basically based on their physiology and culture in some way. Um, it could be that you have something different than your the average member of your species that gives you a spe little special advantage or something that you learn from being a part of that culture that gives you some kind of extra advantage. It doesn't mean that all of them have it as it's an option, it's a talent. And you, again, you can randomly determine it too. So of course, they have Andorians, Bajorans, uh, Beta Zeds, Denobulans, humans, uh, and tolerates. Humans are your jack of all trades as they always are. That's the advantage of our species, as it says, and it actually fits very well within our planet, which uh, I, if anybody ever asks, yes, our species is very jack of all trades because we can spread everywhere very effectively. We're good at it. It's one of our, like, we are, we are cockroach of humanoids. Just remember that. That's why, plus three to three different attributes. That's why we've always been the jack of all trades. It does actually reflect humanity. <laughs> we are the fucking cockroach. We learned how to, like, you, we were good with going to places people don't want to go to. Also, our planet is really chaotic in comparison to a lot of other more habitable planets. We have very bad seasons. Uh, it's very unique for our planet. Uh, most other uh, habitable range planets have a lot less seasonal variation and stuff like that. We had to learn to deal with that shit. Anyway. Trill, Vulcan, Tellarite, uh, they're, they're the base species that are in this book, in the normal book. Um, so understand, just understand that's the, you know, that's why this. So now we have our species. We're whatever we are wanting to play. What was our environment where we grew up on? That's, that's the thing. Regardless of species, you come from somewhere. It's as simple as that. Where was I born? There is six different options for uh, where you were born. And they do talk about it here, culture or monoculture. Um, because, again, like, it's the idea is, uh, there is certainly, you know, if I'm on uh, the Vulcan home planet, uh, you know, um, I'm going to be exposed to a lot of Vulcan culture, but I'm also going to be exposed to Federation culture. You know, Vulcans still retain a lot of their, like, uh, cultural traditions. Um and that's an important thing to think about them, is they try their best to do that amongst the, you know, generalized culture. And, you know, even in amongst these cultures, a lot of them have variations. There are cultures and subcultures amongst Vulc Vulcans that you can get into. Um, it's just like with humans. If I'm from Europe, or I'm from Asia originally, very different cultures different places on the planet for the Vulcans are going to be the same. You can have variations beyond the general just basics. So think about that too. That's an important thing to keep in mind when you're coming from a place. Hey, where am I coming from? Well, uh, similar to before, you get some stuff for 
basically your environment. If we go all the way back to our good old page, I have to remember, 101, you get a value and plus one to a, to, to a, a tribute and plus one to a discipline for your environment. Okay. Now, that, that's the basic way you can think about it, is you get a value here. This is your first value you're choosing. Remember, I talked about values before, that you get a number from your as you're building your character. This first value reflects the, you know, where you came from. Uh, did you come from your own homeworld? Uh, where your civilization was built? If you came from the Vulcan homeworld, uh, did I come from Earth if I'm human? You know? Uh... <laughs> uh, yeah, Vul the Vulcan planet is a very dry planet in general. Uh, it has some wet parts to it, but in general, it's a very dry, a much drier planet than Earth. Um, so it, it, it always has like it has extremes, you know, a lot more. So like the driest parts are very dry, and the and the slightly wet parts are the places where probably you know people more settled, and you know the the places that have the most amounts of water. There's plant life. There are places that are probably more um, watery on the planet. It's just that, you know, it's unfortunate as a drier overall planet, they have less water on their planet than we do. So it's a very... I don't, I don't think Vulcan... Might, Vul, uh, the Vulcan homeworld might not have any major oceans. Or they would be, like, not connected or something. I'd have to, like, look up stuff on it. I just knew they were always a drier world. <clears throat> uh, you could be from a busy colony. That would be like in our system coming from Mars. Because Mars is colonated in the Star, uh, Star Trek future. I could be from Mars. I could be from one of the other, uh, the other solar system based colonies. I could be one from our, one of our earliest colonies we did out in the universe. You know, that is, that is a busy colony. It's a, it's a colony that is very well developed that, you know, was colonized by our people. Or whatever your people are. Uh, an isolated colony is a colony that's kind of on the original borders. As they say, it's one that's kind of a little farther away. You don't connect in with... The, they have kind of their own culture version of things. They don't connect up with the main culture as much. Um, you're kind of separated out a little bit. Um, and that's just like, for whatever reason, you're a little bit more isolated. Uh, whether it's by choice or just in a system that's kind of like out of the beaten path. Um, so people just don't tend to go there. Uh, also, again, they say, like, for unique research opportunities. So you're not necessarily on the frontier of space. You're just in a place that tends to be left alone. So an isolated colony. The busy colonies has a lot of trade. People go to Mars and stuff. Uh, I believe uh, Mars has, in orbit of it, has one of the starship um, uh, uh, construction yards. I think it was Mars. There's, there's one on Earth. It might be Mars. It might be another planet. But anyway... See, that it's a busy colony still. A frontier colony is on the fringes of known space. It's like on the edges of the border and stuff like this. This is way out there, far away. You know, you're, you have some of this technology, but you're not going to be like, you're going to be self-reliant a lot more. While isolated is just, you don't get as much traffic because of the nature of it, but you can connect up as you need. This is, you're in a position where you can't get as much stuff. You know, the isolated colony, people could come by with supplies if we needed them. If we needed some replacement for technology, we could call someone for it, you know, and 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 have them come in. The frontier colony, they might not be able to do that. You're out there. Um, then a starship or star Stardust. You could have been born on a starship. Doesn't necessarily need to be a Starfleet vessel. It could just be a Federation vessel or some other one. Uh, you know, you could be on a, uh, uh, your, your, could be like, uh, your family or are people that do freighters. They have a starship and they transport goods between planets. They're simple, like, uh, transporters, uh, basically space truckers. And they live on the starship. You could have been born there. Or you could have been born on a star base, the star base that orbits Earth. That's where you could have grown up on. You see Earth constantly. You just don't go there normally because it's where you were born. And of course, another species world, this is kind of one where, like, uh, there are people that move into places. Hey, think about Earth. You could be a group of Vulcans that, you know, you, your parents, for whatever reason, moved to Earth. They could have been doing something with the Federation, uh, with the Starfleet, that they were 
living on Earth, and they raised you there because they didn't want you to separate from it. And if they're, both their careers took them there, you know, you are on this very distant planet. So you have your parents that raised you. Okay, so it's 25% water. Thank you. I knew it was a much uh, uh, drier world, and that makes sense then, with 25% water. So you probably still have green, lush places on Vulcan, but it's probably near the water, and a lot of it's not. <laughs> you know, it's it's a very different planet, uh, a very drier planet. Doesn't mean you can't get life on these planets. You can, and doesn't mean intelligent life can't grow up. The Vulcans, you know, they 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 grew through a lot of stuff to get to their point in time. Anyway, so another species home world. So you get a value, you get an attribute, which they tell you kind of an idea of what your attribute is. They give you suggestions, and then disciplines. They also kind of will do that too. Um, if I chose another species world, I can choose any discipline. While, on the other hand, if I chose homeworld, they say, like, command, security, science are the ones that you get a bonus discipline from. Because this is the kind of things that, you know, you're reflecting a lot more on the homeworld uh, as encountering a lot more of kind of thing. Um, the reason the other alien, uh, the uh, another species homeworld, that's because you're, again, your family's there for a reason. That reason could have been medicine. So you learn that from your, like, experiencing parents. Your parents are doctors. You learn a few things about medicine, you know? Maybe you don't, like, really go deep into it, but you probably pick up a few things. Same with, like, a lot of these uh, things. That's that's why it is very open-ended on that one. The other ones tend to reflect the situation you're in. So, now that we have, hey, our home planet, where we were born at, we have to talk uh, your upbringing. Go back to 101. Good back here. Because your upbringing, you get two, plus two to one attribute and plus one to a second attribute. One to a single discipline, a focus, and a talent. Um, we're getting our first focus here. What was that? I have to look that up because it's uh, behind here. There we go. So, uh, let me just check that here. Thank you for the follow. Um, and welcome. Uh, I, I, God, I didn't have that arranged right. So, yeah, we're getting our first focus here. This is something that, during my upbringing, I had something I liked. Think about it that way. My upbringing, I had some kind of, like, hobby or something that stuck with me to my adult years. Uh, maybe, you know, I really enjoyed um, uh, biology. I focus in biology. And, like, when, then, you know, maybe I don't focus on science, but I still learned enough biology that when I, like, have, like, maybe a, a, a discipline of two in science, I didn't really go deep into it. Maybe I'm still, like, a security officer. I know at least about a basic amount of science, and I'm a little bit better on, like, general biology. I could be like, you know, I can, I can assist on that. I, you know... I know a few things because, you know, I studied it. Uh, you know, it was one of my secondary things. But your upbringing is basically your education, your formative years, the influence your parents had on you, what kind of an environment you grew up in. We know, Okay, not what kind of environment, what kind of social situation you grew up in. We already know your planet, your environment, and your species. We're now talking about, you know, how you grew up. And they come down to each of these there are, again, six ones if you want to roll randomly. But there's also this entire thing of each of these upbringings. Um, you uh, either um, accepted it or rebelled against it. That's the important thing about each of these upbringings. You have to choose, like, where I grew up in. And then was I really, like, into that? I was, like, very supportive of that kind of thing. Or was I against that? You know, it, it, it comes for by a dynamic for the characters. Uh, let's give a good example here. Starfleet is one of the upbringings. It means that your family was in Starfleet. Uh, probably both of your parents were officers in Starfleet. They met in the service. They had a family. You were in, you know, like, think about, like, you were raised in that environment under Starfleet. Hey, um, next generation, Wesley Crusher. Both his parents were in Starfleet. Um, granted, Wesley Crusher is a terrible example, but it's the great, the general idea. He kind of accepted that entire thing. 
Another example would be, um, if you go to Voyager, Tom Paris. His father was an admiral in Starfleet. He rebelled against that. He eventually ended up back in Starfleet. So that's the entire idea is that if you rebelled, maybe you never wanted to join Starfleet, but then you have something happen in your life that then you do, you know, some kind of event that happens in your life that you, we can talk about events and stuff, but you know, it, it, it ends up being that entire thing of uh, a development here in the way that you're reacting to your family life. Um, it, what kind of family life you grew up in and were you very accepting of it or rebelling against it? So Starfleet's one of them. Uh, business or trade. Uh, this is like, you know, people that actually like, deal with trade and stuff. Again, remember, basic rates taken care of. Then there's a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. There's, we don't talk about Wesley Crusher. He's not well written. Um, there was a... There, there was a good idea for a character that wasn't as well written as you'd want it to be. Uh, because there are some great episodes and some really terrible episodes. Uh, so as I was saying, um, remember what we're getting for uh, this. Um, we are getting the attribute bonuses, the disciplines, a focus, and a talent uh, for your uh, upbringing. So we're getting a bunch of stuff here. And they tell you uh, your attribute choices um, based on if you accepted or rebelled. Uh, it talks about your uh, disciplines and focus. Your talent's a single talent from the list. Um, um, so, yeah. Anyway. Um, disciplines, again, as I said, like, they tell you where to go and where to get... Uh, because, like, you know, Starfleet 1's a good example of your discipline can kind of be anything because it's, what the heck did my parents do in Starfleet? And then it gives you examples of focuses that you could have had. Again, uh, disciplines are your general, like, big skill groups. Focuses are what you focus down on something that's important to kind of keep an eye on those. And again, talents, you can just choose anyone uh, from the uh, talent list. So, business and trade, you know, you're dealt with a lot of traveling, with dealing with others and stuff. Agriculture or rural? This one is kind of an interesting one, too, because this happens on Earth, too. You could be an agriculture or rural on Earth. Guess what? Earth isn't as overpopulated as you'd think. There was a World War III which super devastated the human population. And right after World War III was when warp travel was di discovered by someone... The Vulcans came in because they detected warp travel, made friends with the humans. Like a couple hundred years later, we have it, what we have now, you know, in, the, in this game, the Federation. You know, Earth's population got devastated. So there are agriculture and rural places you know, on Earth still, you know. The overpopulation, people don't have to worry about as much anyway. There's other planets you can go to. Humans have spread out a lot more. And also, you know, you can have bigger families now anyway, because honestly, they're, they're acceptable for this. There's places you can go to. You don't have to worry about overcrowding. Um, science and technology. There are people that, can, that are scientists or, you know, people that are developing stuff that aren't in Starfleet. Plenty of them go into Starfleet. Starfleet's a really great place to get a good education and stuff. But plenty of them also just study stuff. You know, Starfleet's exploring and discovering and also dealing with science and stuff you know if i want to go to alien planets and study shit or go out into space and study shit that's a great plan to be a scientist if i want to just sit in a lab and tinker with some stuff probably don't have to join starfleet uh, artistic and creative side maybe your parents were actors they still exist or something creative you know, uh, and you're exposed to a lot of different cultures that way. And, of course, diplomacy and politics. Uh, your parents could be di diplomats. Uh, I had a character in a Star Trek one-shot whose parents were two different species that met through diplomacy. And that diplomatic connection, they fell in love, had a child who was of two different races. Um, it was an odd one because uh, he wanted to be, uh, oddly enough, half Vulcan, half Klingon. Which is an odd combination, but we know they can get together because uh, Romulans are compatible with Vulcans because they're related. 
And in one of the storylines, they do show there are, uh, in Star Trek, in the actual Star Trek, they do show that there are half Klingon, half Romulan children that exist. So they are existing. So the half Vulcan, half Klingon was an interesting one, and he played it pretty well for one shot. It was an interesting character. I didn't mind it. It was an interesting concept. A little weird, also because he has diplomats. And, you know, two diplomats that, you know, Vulcans technically can fall in love, which is weird. You know, they have... Uh, attractions in ways but they control it a lot more because again they're controlling emotions uh so you know uh i don't know how that happened but one of the vulcans had a thing for klingons or something in some way whatever you know diplomat parents hey we finished up our childhood now it's time to go to starfleet academy whoa boy <laughs> We've uh, we've enjoyed our time on our home planet, uh, you know, or wherever we came from. We've had our life. It's time to join the academy, which there are academy tracks that you choose from: command, operations, and science. The gantry a value. Uh, three points to spend on two of or three attributes. Um, so, effectively, you either put plus one to three attributes or two to one, one to another. Uh, plus two to single discipline and plus two to one, two other disciplines. Basically, you have a discipline focus and then two others that are, you kind of like were secondary to. Three focuses you gain during this time period. Basically, remember, we're gaining plus one to one discipline, plus two to two other disciplines. There's your three focuses and a talent. Uh, uh, look at that. Uh, if I'm going security first, then medical and science, which is a kind of weird combination, I'm probably going to have a focus for security, then medical, then science. It kind of makes sense. Um, so Starfleet Academy, uh, again, the three tracks are Command, Operations, and Science. Command track tends to be more... Um, uh, it, it's... <sighs> con and uh, like the leadership kind of things. That's where we're getting, getting into those. Uh, your uh, Command and uh, Con... Are under, are, are, are under command, if that makes sense. So your ability to lead uh, is here, but also your ability to pilot a vessel is also here too. Um, operations is maintaining the ship, which comes in two forms, engineering and security. Engineering, maintaining the mechanical part of the ship. Uh, security, maintaining the biological part of the ship, in a way. Uh, and then, of course, the science tracks, which is science and medical. Um, so you can see the four I mean, six disciplines fit under these tracks, where you kind of go into one of them for your... If you're going to the command track, you're either going to be focusing on command or con, probably, for your two. Um, and uh, technically speaking, you can choose others by the way that the game is designed... It's just, you know, up to you how you would want to kind of do it. Um, so, you, you, so, yeah, you can command and con as your major, and then two others that are whatever. Uh, and your attributes can be split, spread for whatever. Again, um, three tributes by one, one attribute by two, one attribute by another. A value, some focuses, and a talent. And you get from these. So, like, you know... If you want to be a flight control officer, a pilot, if you want to go into starship operations, if you want to command your own starship at some point in time, you might want to go into command track. If you want to be like another, you know, James T. Kirk or Captain Picard, command track. On the other hand, if you're big on the engineering um, or, you know, security, you know, like you want to be at the weapons console, uh, that's the operations track. Both of those are very different, but it's the kind of idea that you're very hands-on. Um, dealing with the reality of the mission effectively. Because that's the thing is, that's what the operations track is. You're dealing with the reality of the mission. You're dealing with, like, maintaining the ship uh, and making sure it works to get you to the place. Or, on the security end, you're dealing with not only maintaining the people on there along the way, but when you get there, what do we have to deal with? Do I have to be ready to fight something? Do I have to be able to like, analyze something to see if it's a threat? You know, these are important parts that, you know, that's again why operations is also very important. It's the we great command 
you're saying some nice things about us getting here and exploring. I actually have to get you there and explore for it. And of course, then, you know, the, the science and medical uh, focus is, you know, learning stuff, understanding stuff. Um, there's a lot in this cur curriculum that's very developed. Um, it, again, you certainly um, could go into a lot of different sciences. And the same way as a lot of different developments for medicine, too, and kind of developing it. So you get a lot out of your career path at the Academy or the, uh, I'm sorry, your time at the Starfleet Academy. It has a huge effect on the way your character develops and kind of coming up with these values that's at, that you gained here at the Academy is a pretty good one, too, because like, what did I learn with at the Academy? Now let's talk career. Career here is a pretty simple one, um, and I'm going to say here, when we talk career, you get a value in a talent. So that's not a lot you get from here, but career is basically what you, how you served in Starfleet up until the game. That's it. And they do have four, three choices here. And I'm going to say, I like just doing the experienced officer. That's the one I normally do for most games. Why? It gives the most choice. Uh, you have some years of experience, you've been in Starfleet for a while, you still have a promising career, uh, you know, that's what it is. You get a value reflecting that, which you can have any kind of value, and you get a talent, any kind of talent. I like that as a choice. I like the big choices. But, the other two options are Young Officer and Veteran Officer. What do these mean? Well, Young Officer is you're fresh out of the, you know, uh, academy. You're new on the ship. Uh, you get your value, and then you get the untapped potential trait uh, or talent, which is mentioned right here on the side, right here, the untapped potential here in the PDF, if you want to see it. Same with the veteran, which is for the veteran officer. These are given talents, which they aren't bad, but they are given talents, and, given, and values reflect these a little bit. And the same thing can be said with the veteran officer. You've years of service, um, you're probably a lot older, you've probably reached the peak of where you're going to in your uh, career at Starfleet. Um, you might not get any more uh, promotions and stuff. And honestly speaking, as a veteran officer, you that might not matter to you. Sure, you might still not mind a promotion, but you're not looking for that anyway. You've settled into a good life and you've enjoyed your time as an officer in Starfleet. You served a lot of star bases and ships. Uh, you're you're highly regarded for your experience. You know you're much older. You have a lot more to draw upon for extra information, stuff like that. So again, both interesting ways of playing the game and take a very different direction. I keep this. I like to do this simple experience officer. But if a player came to me with an example of that, or if I came up with a game that would make sense for any of these, I do them. Now we're going to have some fun, because we're coming to step six. We're almost done here. We're up step six of seven. Career events. What the heck does career events do? Well, you get at least two career events, possibly more. Uh, and you can choose these by choice or by random. And you get two tribute points, two discipline points, and two focuses from this. So that's the important thing here. Regardless of the number of career events you have, and regardless of how you chose to choose them, two attributes, two disciplines, two focuses. This is all you get from them. That's an important thing to note because each of these gives one. Okay. Meaning, if I have three or four career events that happen to me, I get more choices on to which ones give me an attribute, a discipline, or a focus. Um, yeah, that's, that's an important thing about it. Um, and you can convent multiple career events into a single event in your backstory. Um, they could be unique on their own, but effectively these events that happen define defining moments in your character's backstory. John Luke Picard, his first ship and its encounter with the Ferengi that resulted in him coming up with Picard maneuver. If you've seen a first season episode that talks about this, uh, that is a defining event in his story. 
It was his first ship he was captain of. And it jettisoned him in Starfleet that he got to be captain of the flagship, eventually, of the Federation, the Enterprise. Um, and as I say, if you wish to have more career events, you mix and match benefits uh, that you get. So you, you still maximize two attributes, two disciplines, two focuses. But again, like, you know, if you're playing a young officer, you might assume that you have less events than if you were a veteran officer and experienced. Um, uh, and a, a young officer, this could have taken place when you were in the academy. Uh, so, like, when you were training, something could have happened. So, they have a D20. Honestly, I like the idea because these exa these events are kind of random things you don't know that can happen or why they happen. I do like the career event table just rolling on this, I'm going to say. I find that fun. It's a great way to develop your character, but if a character had a good story or something that they wanted to tell and came to me and said, I want this career event, I would honestly allow it. And again, the same thing is, I, I usually go for just having the two. If someone wants to have another one, well, maybe you can work with that or something. Uh, the two keep it simple. Extra ones, you know, we can have them. Um, you can see that they are very different. Uh, your ship is destroyed. The ship you're on is destroyed. Pretty simple. That has an effect on you. And they ask questions and talk about stuff about what that meant for you. And the thing is, tell why it was destroyed. All that kind of stuff. Uh, an important friend died. How'd they die? What happened? Was it on a mission? Was it just in life? Do you feel like you're a br blame? Lauded by another culture. Uh, a non-Federation culture. Uh, you know, you're a friend of that people. What happened that you befriended these people? Uh, you helped negotiate a treaty. Where were you when that happened? Um, a treaty within the Federation or outside of the Federation? Uh, what kind of treaty was it? Uh, required to take command. Something happens and your character takes a leadership position. Um, encounter with a truly alien being. Something outside the realm of uh, normal comprehension. You met Cthulhu. I mean, Cthulhu's terrible. They have, like, space monsters and weird shit that happen in Star Trek all the time. Just look it up. But basically, you know, you met Cthulhu and you're like, hmm, interesting. Um, you had a serious injury. Uh, is it something that you have replications, like a prosthesis or cybernetics from? Did you go blind like Jordy and have, like, a visor or something like that, you know? Um, serious injury is a big one that can have effect. Uh, conflict with the hostile culture. You got into a fight with some people. Uh, mentored. An important person in Starfleet mentored you. Or someone that has a lot of experience. <laughs> Maybe when, um, if we're talking post-DS9, uh, post-Dominion War, and we're playing in that era, which is the next gen era at its furthest date, you could have been mentored by, let's say, like, if you're an engineer, Miles O'Brien. He went to teach at the Academy. We know that from, like, the, the storyline after post-DS9. That's where he goes to. He goes to, after the Dominion, where he kind of retires to the Academy to teach engineering. He's a pretty goddamn good engineer. He wasn't an officer in Starfleet, but he was kind of lauded for a lot of his skill and stuff. Uh, he was he was a uh, enlisted. Still, could teach you a lot about engineering. You were in a transport accident. What the hell happened up? Do you have an evil twin? Do you have a, just a twin that may or may not be evil? Uh, A.K.A. Riker and his twin who started out not evil and kind of went a little evil. You dealt with a plague. Uh, disease is still an issue. Uh, betrayed ideals for superior. That's an interesting one. That's something Riker did in his backstory. There's an entire idea. Uh... Look, I like O'Brien. You know, I do. I really do. I like I like him being as a mentor too. Again, that's the thing. It's like if if I'm taking place post Voyager in the next gen era, honestly, I could have him there. There's a lot of people I could have it. Like you know, you could be mentored by a lot of different people because you know like as these ships break apart and the people get other jobs, main characters, or you could just have like an important person. You, you don't even have to have someone that's actually a named character from Star Trek. You can come up with someone that was an important like you know, hey. Uh, someone important in the Federation, uh, like a representative of a planet, 
uh, liked me and mentored me on diplomacy. Now, maybe I have this focus in diplomacy that I'm really good at it, that I'm really great at treaties, and that that's part of my command structure, and maybe they send me particular or, or the ship I'm on to places because they know I'm really great at negotiating treaties and stuff, especially for peace. That could be something. It would be really cool to have as like a good backstory. Um, but yeah, Riker betrayed his ideals for superior and part of his backstory. You learn it eventually. There's an entire storyline that he actually did that. And that's something that you have to do. And that might be, you know, because you go your ideals versus your superior and having respect for them and the decisions they're making. Called out a superior is the opposite of that one. That's kind of like your superior is doing something. Whether it's for the Federation or not, you might not like like it or something. Calling them out about it is like challenging your superior. It's like sticking with your ideas. It's kind of the opposite. So they kind of fit with each other. Uh, a new battle strategy. Um, something's going wrong. You're in a fight or something. And uh, you uh, suggest a strategy that wins the day. You know? Uh, learn a unique language. You, those, those people that speak in metaphors, you went and learned their language. Honestly, the people that, you know... Um, uh, Picard made friends with the uh, Tanakwa people. I cannot remember their names or anything, but like you know, he spent the entire time with the weird energy being that they were trying to communicate in weird languages. You went and learned that somehow, and you're like, yeah, look, man, it's it's that language. Don't ask me to try to like talk to you to teach it. It required me years of hanging out with those dudes. Uh, discover an artifact. You find some kind of weird piece of technology or something from an ancient civilization you never knew existed, and you're like, I discovered this. That's pretty cool. Uh, the Tamarians, thank you. Uh, yeah, the Tamarians. God, you learned the Tamarian language. <laughs> oh. Uh, a special combination. This is basically you got a kind of reward for something. Um, I found a flute. It's a flute from an ancient empire that no longer exists that was known for their great artistic work. Honestly, that would be kind of interesting. They were never known to have... Uh, they are known for their great artistic work. They're known to be an extinct civilization on this one planet, and they never had space travel. Why is their flute on a satellite? That's an interesting artifact, artifact uh, discovery that was never just, uh, understood why. Special combination, anyway. Um, and it's of the, an age very similar to when the flute would have come from, uh, or something like that. Uh, you know, we, we come up with a cool storyline. Um, you can command a, a co commendation for something. Solve an engineering crisis. Granted, this one, I even if you have an engineering of one, I'd say you could have come up with a reason or, you know, like, um, thought of something a little bit different. Because again, like, remember, you have a one in every discipline. You know a lot of the basics and stuff like that. Maybe you don't know exactly, but you remember, like, maybe you remembered something from your one of your engineering classes when you learned those basics that was something that was just mentioned off edge that's something that's like an outdated bit of technology or knowledge that you're like hey wait a second what about this and you brought that up and allowed your chief engineer to solve a problem because of that you don't have to be the chief engineer or a part of engineering to solve an engineering crisis it's you just have to be part of the team that's trying to help it out a breakthrough uh, or invention you made something uh, you developed a special technique. You, uh, you know, came up with some kind of thing uh, in science before joining Starfleet. Uh, and of course, or during Starfleet, you were developing something. And of course, first contact, which is the very obvious one. All right. Let's talk about your finishing touches. We're almost done our character here. I, I really like the, um, honestly, I like the career events a lot. They add so much to your character, the career events. So at this point in time, the finishing touches, you will be gaining one more value to finish up our values, plus two to two attributes, plus two to two uh, disciplines. We will adjust our maximums and our numbers, get derived scores, and everything else your character gets as a basic Starfleet and slash Star Trek character. So you get your final value, representing your entire life and career. You cannot have an attribute above 12. Uh, and you may not have any one, more than one attribute at 12. This is an important thing to say right now. Um, if, by chance, everything you did has added up to more than 112, or a number above 12, you adjust them. Um, you basically reduce one attribute, raise another. 
limits still apply. So if, like, I've ended up with a 13 in something, I can drop it down to a 12 and put that plus one to somewhere else. Um, after you've done that and you have only one 12 and nothing above a 12, then you add plus two to the normal limits can't have a 12. So it's sort of like, okay, I've got like a 12 and 11. Well, I got to add my plus two to other places. Disciplines are very similar. You can't have above a five. Five is the maximum. And you can't have more than one discipline out of five during character creation. Uh, and again, also untapped potential. You can't have any attribute above four. That's another thing with the young people. They can't have attribute above four. That's a note there too. Um, if, again, similar to the attribute. If you have one above, you lower it. You raise something else somewhere else. And after that, you add plus two to two disciplines. Again, there's only no fives. So you got some final details. The final checks. All right, what are the final checks? Well, if I take all of my attributes and add them together, it should add up to 56. Simple as that. If I add up all of my numbers together, add up to 56. All six of them. My disciplines should add up to 16. Add all six of them together. 16. Uh, you should have four values, four talents, and six focuses. These are the basically, as long as you have these things, your character is correctly done. Simple as that. Your character has a stress equal to their finesse attribute plus their dis secured discipline. What the hell is stress? It's your health. It's your health. So um, you don't take the in injury the same way. We're not talking about that today since it's a character creation guide. That's a how to play the game guide, which I'll have to probably do one of these at some point in time. But, you know, hey, your stress is effectively your health. It's your finesse plus your security. Simple as that. Effectively, how well you're trained in, you know, dealing with that crap and how physically you're able to deal with that crap. Damage bonuses. A uh, character gains a uh, symbol equal to their security discipline. We'll talk about that. That's for combat, which we'll talk about. And we have personal details. Hey, what the frick is your name and age? Uh, they do have a sidebar on, like, ages and stuff for different uh, species. And basically a rough description based on whatever your species is of your character. There you go. Personal details. Pretty simply done. Your department. Uh, remember, there's six departments. Which department are you uh, in? Well, the easiest way to say that is, what's my highest value? In case of a tie, choose. The thing is, again, five is the maximum. I can only have five. But what if I have, like, two fours? Honestly, remember, it adds up to 16. I can have two fours, uh, two fours, two threes, and uh, two ones. Yeah. Two fours, two threes, and two ones. So those two fours, I can be part of either of those departments. But I choose that. A rank and roll. Uh, this is based on what the GM decides. Where you are. And what role you are on the ship. If I'm having you be the command officers of a starship. I, you know, and you have, you're in the security department. I honestly might make you chief of security. Um, and that's an important thing. More than one character in the department can still be okay. First season of Star Trek, uh, Tasha and Worf were both basically security. Tasha was the chief of security. Worf was a high ranking member of security. They both were main characters, kind of. Well, mainish characters. So you can see, you can have different ranks, different roles. Uh, whether or not you have a, like an actual name role or something like, you know, uh, the vice chief of security, you know, the vice chief engineer, if we have multiple engineers or something. Which, you know, I, I like the idea of your characters spreading out their jobs throughout the ship. But if, they, if you want to, like, focus a little bit, honestly, it's not terrible. You can have a chief of uh, a chief medical officer, and honestly, someone that studies medicine that's a science officer. Equipment, you get a communicator and uh, whatever you get for basically like uh, some other stuff. You get your communicator, or if you're an original series, the flip phone. <laughs> uh, yeah. Tasha was killed by Venom, aka Black Goo. It really kind of was Venom. I heard someone describe it as that recently. Um, the sexism was an earlier episode. Um, but yeah, 
No, uh, she wanted to leave the show because she didn't like the way that her character was being treated. And then uh, uh, I think the interesting comment about her, or her entire thing is if they wrote her character like they did in the, ca in the episode where she died, she would have wanted to stay around. And that was the sad thing. Look, first season of Star Trek, next gen, a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues. Oh, God. Mm, mm, mm. You know, <laughs> see, they give examples of names uh, for the different uh, species that you can be. Uh, again, human. We know humans. It's Earth still. You, you can be anything named from Earth. Uh, but they give other examples of different areas. Personality, appearance, relationships, rank and roll. They talk about this a little bit. Uh, about the different major commands that you can be members of. This is stuff that, like, I would talk to you about, but a lot of times I, as the GM, am assigning you. Um, like, for when it comes to rank and roll. Your relationships, like, whether you have relationships with other people on the ship, or you have relationships with other people that aren't on here. <coughs> like, if I'm doing an ongoing series, and I know about a father that's in Starfleet or something, I could bring on that father in Starfleet for an episode. You know? So these are like little finishing touches to develop the rat last part of your character and make it a character. Um, they do talk about enlisted personnel here. Because again, remember, we were talking about Starfleet, but we're not talking about enlisted, which, remember, O'Brien was an enlisted officer. Um, he was an enlisted personnel. I would say I'm not against allowing enlisted personnel as a character. But I would like one a good story as to why you're there, why you're important to the crew. You know, um, O'Brien was the chief. He was the big engineer on DS9. You know, he was the top engineer on DS9. He was only enlisted. He wasn't an officer, but they didn't really have an officer. You know, he had enlisted. He was only enlisted. So it's an interesting kind of juxtaposition. And of course, ranks, which, you know, I tend to throw out uh, lieutenant commander, lieutenant, uh, depending on the situation, sometimes lower ones. You could all be ensigns, lowest rank of officers. And of course, equipment, uniform, communicator, tricorder, uh, a phaser, and any kind of tools you need for your job. You need a hypo spray? You got a hypo spray. You need one of those little engineering tool kits that Jordy kind of carries around? You got one of that. If you're uh, security, you have type 2 phaser. You could blast the crap out of people. And senior officers honestly, have that sometimes too. Uh, if you really need to. And your character is done. And we'll just see the character sheet here. Um, it's very bright. I do like the one on Roll20 because it's uh, they changed the brightness to dark. <laughs> but you can see, like, this is an example where they have the two numbers. You add them together for your 2d20 where you're rolling under. I rolled an 8. I rolled 2. I would have two successes on a control command check. Cool. Um, and that's basically your character in a Star Trek adventure game. And honestly, um, you've done a lot already here. Because diving down into all these different aspects of your character helps you understand where your character's coming from. And I think that's an important step of this. Because again, it's a very different world than a lot of other game settings. It's a specific world is the thing, too. If I'm playing in a Star Wars game, certainly I can be something like a Jedi, or I could be something like a smuggler, or I could just be a dude from a place. But that's a very grounded, I would say, down-to-earth type of game because you can kind of have a lot of different variety of characters, and whatever you want, you can probably develop. Um... Similarly, a lot of fantasy games have a specific way that they're played, and they're very standard. Uh, a lot of media is played that way. Uh, the simple, like, ah, oh, enemies, to fight them in combat, and stuff like that. This is a world where combat is, like, your last option in a lot of ways. And it's a little bit more based on exploration. But also, your characters are in a semi-military hierarchy. That's another thing you have to kind of think about. You're, as much as you're an explorer and a discoverer or diplomat or anything like that, there is this rank system because there's a very militaristic hierarchy to Starfleet. The reason being, hey, if shit goes wrong, we need a command structure. We need to be ready to fight, you know, 
when that stuff goes wrong, if there's an enemy. But if there isn't, you know, we still need, like, order on these ships and stuff like that. And a lot of science officers, you know, you're there and maybe you're not in the normal hierarchy of stuff. But you could be a science officer that's a lieutenant commander and have a bunch of ensigns assigned under you that are, you know, if they want to do their own experiments, you have to lead them. Or if they're helping you with your experiment, you have to lead them also. Like, if, if they're doing separate experiments, you have to watch and understand what their experience are. You have this hierarchy to keep things in order. There is things that are not, like, that are just assumed. Like, uh, I like in the uh, season finale of um, Star Trek Next Generation Season 1. They do say, like, anybody can get on the comms at any time. They don't do it on, like, the general comms, unless it's, like, an emergency or important, because people have self-control and know when to use it. You know when to, like, go onto the bridge. You know the etiquette of a lot of these things. Because it's etiquette that everybody knows and goes under. And that certain people just don't go there unless they have a need to go there and things like that. Um, understanding the ranking system, the hierarchy, the world is important because it helps you play in the game and it is certainly a world that even if you don't watch a star trek which i mean a lot of us honestly out there have probably seen a star trek either one of the movies or some of the tv series there's a lot of media for it if you haven't you don't really need to you just have to kind of understand some of these basic concepts of its utopian society and you got a job here uh that might happen. A problem child causing comms and purchase. And then they get like it, the, the ability to do that taken away or something. Or they get in trouble. You know, it honestly could happen. Um, so Utopian Society, you're kind of a semi-militaristic organization that's mainly made for peacekeeping. Uh, and, uh, you know, peacekeeping, relief efforts, exploration, and scientific discovery. Those are like the four things that your military organization is doing. Peacekeeping, if there's an issue going on, you're ready to defend or to, you know, attack. Uh, uh, relief efforts if there's like a uh, like a major disaster somewhere or some kind of issue or a plague or some kind of thing or something that needs to be transported you're ready for it uh, exploration hey there's this place that we don't know about go there and find stuff out and of course science there's some things that have to be studied and discovered that you know could, that information can be brought back and granted there are science vessels there's medical vessels um, you know there's specifically more transport vessels. There are vessels that are more hit for this. But whatever type of ship you're on, it's assigned to this because of, you know, maybe you're close enough. Hey, this sciencey thing is happening. Your vessel has enough uh, material to go check it out. Go check it out. Get the basic information. Send it back to the scientists that really can understand it a lot more. But take a lot of sensor readings. Send a couple of probes. Discover stuff. That's Star Trek at a whole. And getting these concepts down is a great way of building your understanding of what you have to do to build a character. And understanding that, like, I like that you build your life. Think about this. The, the steps are species, your environment you were born in, how you were raised, how your time in Starfleet Academy was, how your time post-Academy was major events that happened to your character that develops yourself as understanding where your character come from their history and stuff like that and it helps you develop a backstory pretty simply developing a star trek character is developing a character with a backstory that's another concept between this kind of character creation i really like anyway that's probably enough for today we talked for about an hour and a half. Um, uh, there is more to talk about for Star Trek. I do want to go over the basic systems, but there is a bunch to do there. So let's ha save that for another day uh, and another time talking tabletop for um, this. If you like my discussions on um, t t tabletop talks, I do these every Tuesday and Thursdays. Um, uh, these do eventually uh, get put up onto YouTube. Um, so if you're on YouTube now checking this out, thanks for hanging on. My link's in the description 
for my Twitch stream if you're on YouTube. If you're on Twitch, hey, I've got my links to the YouTube channel also. Hey, you know, check them out. Uh, anyway, um, I think that's good enough for today. Uh, thank you for those of you who joined me live. Thanks of you that joined. Check this out uh, when it's uh, up on YouTube. And hey, everybody, Star Trek Adventures is a fun one. I hope everybody checks out my once a year live plays of May the 4th be with Star Trek. Uh, I've got them up on YouTube right now, and uh, they are when I play a Star Trek game on Star Wars Day. I do it yearly. I'll be doing it, uh, you know, this year too. So, uh, and again, check it out. Anyway, farewell, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and uh, again, hope you enjoyed learning a thing or two about this really cool RPG game that's uh, really fun to play. Farewell to all.